Okay, I'm going to get started. My name is Jeffrey Hart. Uh, I'm Emeritus Professor of Political Science, and uh, my topic today is the European Union Challenges and Opportunities. Uh, if you want to know more about me, just Google me. Uh, that's the best way. I even have a Wikipedia page, so that, wow. yeah, I know, I, I wrote it myself. <laughs> just full of praise. <laughs> How, how many of you have, like, recently been to Europe? Okay. Was it a bargain? No. No? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, wa watch, that, <coughs> watch that currency exchange rate. But anyway, um, a lot of us are worried about Europe uh, because the British are going to vote on June 23rd whether to stay or leave. And I will get to that topic. I know everybody is buzzing about that. Uh, but I have to give you a little background, so I'll give you some background. And uh, there are a couple other important things going on in Europe, so I, I, you know, I have to cover the whole, the whole uh, territory, so I'm going to do that. Um, so basically, uh, I want to start with a little historical background. And um, I, I think you, you probably all have been exposed to this, but the, the beginning in the 50s with the creation of the European coal and steel community. I mean, the basic idea about the origins of the European Union uh, go back to World War II and the desire to avoid another world war, uh, especially starting in Europe. Um, so uh, the leaders of France, <coughs> Germany, and Britain decided uh, that uh, it would be a good idea to sort of institutionalize peace. Um, uh, the British didn't get involved uh, fully until later, but nevertheless, uh, those were the three big powers that were uh, concerned about an, having another war in Europe. Um, so the, the European coal and steel community was the first, uh, first institution created, mainly to allow for uh, recovery from the damages of World War II uh, using the resources of, of the uh, the two, two major continental powers, France and Germany, to allow them to exchange with one another freely. In 1957, uh, the European Economic Community was created by the Treaty of Rome, and that was the original six members of the European Union. Um, in 1992, uh, the, con the unified market was created uh, with the Maastricht Treaty. Um, and, uh, and many, uh, we'll talk about the expansion of the membership in a bit. In 1985, the Schengen Agreement was passed, uh, which uh, abolished the requirement for people who were, uh, who were citizens of countries in the European community to use passports at the border. So basically the idea was to allow for free movement of people. Uh, and uh, the euro, as a, s a single European currency, uh, was created, uh, actually created in 1997, but came into being in 1999. Um, there are currently 28 members of the European Union. Uh, you can see that uh, starts with the six, Belgium, France, Germany, Italy, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. Uh, in 1973, um, Denmark, Ireland, and the United Kingdom were added. In 1981, Greece joined. In 1986, Portugal and Spain. In 1995, Austria, Finland, and Sweden. <coughs> 2004, a lot of countries came on. Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia. Um, by the way, if you look at this animation, uh, one of, does anybody notice anything curious? There's something going on up here. Yeah. What's that? What happened? Iceland. That's yeah, Greenland. 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 Yeah, Greenland. Green, Greenland, right, yeah. right. Greenland was a, uh, a colony of Denmark. Uh, they decided to leave the European Union in 1973, I believe, so that's why they go out. Um, uh, so 2007 was Bulgaria and Romania, and the most recent member is Croatia in 2013. That brings it up to, to uh, 28. Uh, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about the euro and the, the, um, the, the fact, of course, one of the big facts is that not every member of the European Union 
is a member of the Eurozone uh, using Euro as their primary currency. And uh, if you look at the blue bars, those are the countries that joined the Euro system. So you have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 in 1999. Uh, 12, a little bit later when, uh, what is that? Greece joins. I, I remember, I, I don't know how many of you traveled to Greece in the last few years or so, but I, I remember uh, we went just after they joined uh, the Eurozone, and it was like magic. You, you put your credit card into the ATM in Greece, and the Euros would come out. It was, I don't know, I, I just thought it was, it was a mystical experience. <laughs> yeah, no more drachma, but yeah. that may come back. We, we'll talk about it. Okay, um, so you have the East European countries and Cyprus uh, joining the Euro, uh, Lithuania being the latest uh, to do so. We have a lot of uh, countries that, let's see, the green are the EU members outside the, uh, the ERM, which is part of the system, with the currency pegged to the Deutschmark and the Euro. Um, you've got uh, some countries you can see that have never joined, uh, UK being the most important one, Sweden, Poland, Czech Republic. Denmark is right. Uh, where is it? Just above UK. Just above UK. Yeah, right. And I, I don't know why they're gray. Oh. Well, they're, they peg their currency. So they're, they're not a Euro currency, but they, they're pegged. Okay. So um, now, uh, so what we have with the beginning of the Euro system, the Eurozone, is there's some distinction within Europe of members who have certain privileges and some who have others. Um, Europe is not, uh, a, it, it is a collection of countries of different size and different weight. Uh, this shows their weight by GDP, uh, a little bit old 2012 data, but um, you can see the largest by GDP is Germany, second largest is France, uh, then comes UK, Italy, Spain, and then all the other countries are somewhat smaller. So, um, as you would expect, because of this difference in economic power, um, that's reflected to some degree in influence in the system. Uh, and in recent years, Germany has played uh, a, a growingly important role. Um, so, I, I get it. <laughs> Does anybody know the refer referral here? This is The Economist. There's An Angela Merkel. Uh, and she says it's only resting. Uh, you know Monty Python, a dead parrot routine. That's <laughs> and of course, the parrot is there with it. It's got the Euro bag <laughs> for an IV. Okay. Uh, but, you know, basically the problem is Europe has been growing really slow. I mean, they, we're growing slow, but they're growing slower. And this is a problem for them uh, because uh, that means that people speculate against their currency and towards the dollar. People would rather bought, borrow uh, uh, U.S. Treasury bonds than to buy Euro bonds, for example. That, is, uh, that makes it more expensive for them to sell Euro bonds. But anyway, slow growth is, is a, 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 a problem that's been around for a couple decades now, and uh, the question is what to do about it. Um, so uh, now there's, along with slow growth, and particularly immediately after the financial crisis of 2007-2008, um, Europe had some trouble recovering, just like we did, only um, some of the countries of Europe, um, particularly of the European Union, had a lot of trouble uh, recovering. And uh, so uh, unemployment levels went up, growth rates went down, uh, and there was particularly uh, great difficulty of just, uh, adjusting to the new economic environment uh, that existed after 2007-2008. Um, there's some regions of Europe which are not very competitive internationally. And these regions tended to suffer uh, partly because their imports went up um, 
uh, from other parts of Europe, particularly from Germany, uh, but uh, they also were not able to export very well, either within or outside Europe. Um, so that created some problems for them, the, what you call balance of payments deficits, along with the budget deficits that occurred. And I'll talk about those budget deficits in a bit. Um, so one of the things that people are, are, are thinking about uh, in Europe is, was it a good deal? Did we agree to something maybe too hastily that we shouldn't have agreed to? And can we undo that deal? And so that's why we have Brexit and Brexit. Everybody knows what Brexit means? Green, green, green. Free catch. Yeah. And you know what Brexit means? British. British. OK, so I don't have to even tell you that. That's great. And so I'm going to talk about them a little bit in detail. And, uh, but probably more importantly for the long term, is this low growth and high unemployment and general dissatisfaction with, with the state of the world has created a rise of some new political parties, which are uh, populist, nationalist, and racist. And does that sound familiar? <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the things we have in common with Europe. We have a lot of things in common with Europe. That's one of them. Okay, so let's look at GDP growth. Um, this is indexed to 2008. And so the ones that go lowest, those are the ones that take the biggest hit. Okay? And um, everybody takes a hit right after the financial crisis. You see that. Everybody did. So some, some of these countries recovered pretty quickly and successfully. So the, this line is Belgium. The black line is Germany. Uh, the, I think this purplish line is France. They've done okay. Uh, let's see, I think, yeah. Britain is the gray line. Now they, they took them a while to come back, but they did. Um, the Dutch did well at first, and then they had problems. I don't know why. Anybody know why? Uh, I have great colleagues who study the Netherlands. And I went to a conference, which was about 2010-11, and they were singing Netherlands, the Netherlands' praises <laughs> for how well it had done. Well, it was a little premature. Um, anyway, but there's Greece, the worst performer of all. It's sad, and I'll we'll talk about that in detail. Uh, Portugal did badly at first, but it seems to have come back a little bit. Uh, Ireland was Europe's economic miracle. And it's starting to come back again, but not, still not great shape. And Finland, which we always thought of as a, as, a, as a great example of a northern European country that had adjusted well to everything, uh, had started to have problems in the 2011-2012 period. So, um, so here's what happens. Uh, in terms of uh, the pain that was distributed after 2007, 2008. So here we have the Eurozone as a whole. Uh, these are unemployment rates went up everywhere, basically. So that's reflected in the average for the Eurozone. Um, the highest increases in unemployment are in Greece and Spain. Uh, Portugal, somewhat lower, but still around 18%, which is way too high. Um, Italy didn't do too well either at 12%, uh, and I think the yellow is, I can't really read that. Sorry, I think that's the Netherlands. Okay, but um, in terms of other countries, no, that's not the Netherlands. Take that down. Italy is yellow. Yeah, it's just Italy, it's just yellow, that's right. That's the color. Okay, the Eurozone countries also experienced increased unemployment, but here's Germany went up to what, about 5%? Austria is still down at 4%. Uh, Belgium stabilized around 6%. And uh, France did a little worse at about 10%. So, so um, the core countries did OK, uh, relatively speaking, although they're still higher than they, they'd like to be. And if you look at it on the map, <coughs> The darker colors are the high unemployment countries, so basically all of Southern Europe. And uh, 
The uh, northern European countries, as usual, are the lowest in unemployment. Uh, Ireland, not so great, but... Yeah, I remember uh, one of the things that we, we, we heard about Ireland was, for a while, um, people from Poland were coming to work in Ireland, and then at, at a certain point, when the Irish miracles sort of stopped happening, then the Irish people went to Poland to work. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. That must have been very interesting. For okay. Um, so what are the causes of the sluggish growth? Well, nobody knows absolutely for sure, uh, but clearly the crisis set it off. And, and the question is, why didn't they recover faster? It's the same question that we have. And there were countries that engaged in what's called deficit spending. That's where you spend more money uh, from the government than you take in in taxes and other kinds of revenues, okay? So they use deficit spending just the way uh, Keynesian economics would say you should in order to stimulate the economy. And uh, anybody know what one of the uh, relatively short-term consequences of deficit spending? Inflation. You can get inflation. In this case, it did not occur. Uh, so it, if you engage in deficit spending for too long, uh, you have what's called, uh, uh, you have to finance your deficit, unless you're the United States. We have the privilege. We can export our deficit to some degree. But uh, that's our, our privilege as number one world power. But uh, uh, we shouldn't overdo that either. Uh, the, the, the debt levels went up everywhere, so deficit spending means increased debt levels. And uh, increased debt uh, leads to, generally, increased interest rates in weaker economies. So as you become more indebted, the people who lend money say, well, I'm not so sure I'm going to get paid back, paid back on my loans. And so uh, I think it's riskier, therefore I require a higher rate of interest. And so you, you started to see, uh, I'll, I'll show you in the next slide, how, how that impacts some of the countries in Europe. Um, a lot of countries adopted austerity policies after using uh, deficit spending for a while uh, as a way to bring the, uh, the budget deficit back into surplus or at least into lower levels of deficit and to deal with the debt problem. And, you know, in the United States also we have people who say we should be engaging in austerity policies. Well. The problem with engaging in austerity policies when the, when the economy is not growing very fast is that the economy grows even slower, okay? And so if you're trying to grow your way out of a deficit, engaging in austerity is not going to be very helpful. Yes? What stopped the Irish miracle was a bank scandal. They had a banking scandal like we did, where they had to pump in the government had to bail them all out and I th from what I read I think that was really sort of the underpinnings of the miracle yeah, a real estate. well yeah there there were a lot of real estate is another part of it and of course the big cause of the 2007-2008 crisis was uh, a crash in the real estate markets that then almost brought down the world economy so uh, H have any of you seen uh, The Big Short? Yes. Isn't that a great movie? Yes. I love that movie. It was really terrific. And, and they didn't get anything wrong. I mean, you know how movies always get things wrong? And the book itself, I, I can recommend the book also. It's a great, great read. Okay, so uh, The Big Short. Uh, got nominated for a bunch of Academy Awards. It's, it's amazing, amazing. Hey, what, 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 who was it? Selena Gomez explained oh, yeah. uh, CDOs. Uh, uh, yeah, in the bathtub. <laughs> Made it a little more interesting. Okay. <laughs> so, so the, the there there are you know when I remember I mentioned that besides the low growth there was a kind of competitiveness issue along with the low growth, particularly in certain regions of Europe, and. Uh, you needed to restructure the less competitive sectors to some degree to try to re re restore competitiveness. And that was not done as quickly as it should have been done. Uh, 
uh, and, and particularly some areas of the financial system which are still not uh, quite set up correctly, uh, that again, that was delayed uh, beyond what it should have been. Okay, so I was telling you again about interest rates going up. This is a chart that illustrates, this is before the introduction of the euro, and this is different countries, uh, what's called the bond yields on uh, government bonds, and you can see that there are some bonds, and I think the red one is Greece, uh, that receive a huge premium, uh, very high uh, premium on, um, on their bonds, uh, and that reduced drastically as Greece entered the Eurozone. Uh, and generally speaking, everybody's uh, uh, interest rates declined during this period from 1999 to 2007. Um, the, in general, the European economy uh, enjoyed very low inflation rates, and so that's one of the reasons why the bond yields go down. But after 2007, look what happens. The, the big spreads return, uh, and Ireland suffers from that as well uh, as, as Greece. Um, what this means is that all of a sudden it's much more expensive to finance your deficit than it was before. Your, your bonds are, are uh, require a very high interest rate. And it also means that the market thinks your bonds aren't very good. It means they think they're not going to get paid back. And uh, so that's why they charge more money. So, so let's go back to the whole question of was it a good idea to, to make a deal to join the Eurozone? And uh, one of my colleagues here, Michele Fratiani, who was a business, uh, economic, uh, a business economist in the business school, has made a bunch of very uh, compelling arguments about this. Basically, uh, the Eurozone means that Europe, uh, the members of the Eurozone will have a single monetary policy. Uh, they pretend to do so because they have a European Central Bank, which is supposed to operate alongside of the national central banks in the Eurozone. And uh, that um, uh, to have a common currency, you need to sort of have things within that whole zone uh, correlated with one another so that you can't have big dispersions and also maintain the currency unity. Otherwise, you'll see the kinds of uh, what's, what we've seen. Um, uh, so you can't use a currency exchange rate like you used to be able to when you weren't in the Eurozone to adjust for changes in competitiveness over time. So if Greece had not been in the Eurozone, it would have changed the drachma to euro exchange rate in order to remain more or less competitive with the rest of Europe. But it couldn't do that because it was a member of the euro. Okay? So in other words, one of the options you have to manage your economy was gone. And in the case of Europe, of Greece, this was very costly for them. So who benefited from the system? Well, it was Germany and Belgium and the Netherlands and a few others um, who managed to keep their international competitiveness high. Uh, they kept their unemployment lower. They kept their growth a little higher, not too much. Uh, they, uh, so, uh, and relatively speaking, a very few countries, in the case of Germany, a big country, benefited a lot, while a lot of other countries uh, were suffering. So one of the reasons they suffered so much is, uh, is ironic. That is, they tried to provide the same social guarantees as the Northern European countries. They thought, okay, I'm now I'm a member of the European Union, and even better, I'm a member of the Eurozone, so I can have the same kind of social safety net as the richer countries have. And that turned out to be very expensive for them. Okay? It, 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 was, it was, in other words, it was, a, it was a, a goal that was worth pursuing, but unfortunately had bad consequences. So the debt to GDP ratio measures how sustainable your debt is. Okay, everybody uses this measure. You divide debt in, bil in billions, or in some cases trillions, by your GDP, your gross domestic product. And you want that to be lower. Okay, you don't want it to be higher. But everybody's debt to, debt to GDP went up uh, over this period. Uh, Italy, Ireland, Portugal, France, 
uh, everybody. So the, this is the European, uh, this is the Eurozone, 17. There it goes, goes up to. So what, what are austerity policies? Well, one of the things you do is you reduce spending. And there, just like in the United States, there are only a certain number of discretionary spending areas. Uh, generally speaking, you're locked into certain kinds of uh, welfare payments, uh, particularly with national pension schemes and so forth. Um, but they did reduce spending in health, education, and welfare, scaled back pensions, uh, particularly for government employees. Um, and just generally reduced spending, reduced the sizes of bureaucracies and so forth. And they increased taxes. Um, everybody know what a value-added tax is? Yes. Okay. It's like a sales tax uh, collected at the point of sale. Um, has anybody gotten their VAT uh, refunded when they came back to the United States? Yeah. It's not easy, but you can do it. Yeah, you got to really go through a lot of Yeah, it, it's a lot of bureaucracy. And anyway... Uh, they use VAT taxes mainly to fund government operations, and VAT tax, as you know, is a regressive tax, so, uh, but it's easy to collect, and uh, it's fairly predictable, um, unlike uh, income taxes, especially income taxes that are passed, uh, income tax laws that are passed by the U.S. Congress. Okay. So uh, they also increase wealth taxes, so the... Uh, the back tax are regressive, it hurt poor people more than rich people, but so they also increased wealth tax. And uh, then um, there were labor market reforms that resulted in wage reductions. So generally speaking, throughout Europe, um, most European workers uh, saw a hit in their paychecks as well as uh, in other areas in their employment, for example. Okay, so here's the change in wage rates. These are real unit labor costs with 1999 set as 100. And you can see that some countries actually tried to increase their labor costs. That's not sustainable, is it? <laughs> that was Ireland. Uh, that got them in trouble. Finland shouldn't have done it either, but they did. Uh, but look at, you know, this is Greece. This is, Port this is Spain. And this is Portugal. So they tried to keep the wage levels up, but they, they dropped precipitously. And here's, here's a great example of what happens uh, when you borrow in order to finance government operations. Uh, so in Greece, expenditure continued to rise after 2007, and uh, revenues leveled off and started to decline. So the difference between this and this is net borrowing. And, and now that net borrowing increases your debt. So that's where the debt crisis in, in Greece came from. And if you looked at the same statistics for Spain, uh, for Portugal, for Italy, uh, for Ireland, I think, also, and, uh, you would find the same thing. In fact, everybody started to refer to those countries as the pigs, P-I-I-G-S, okay? Uh, let's see. Oh, I don't I think I have. Do I have them later? Yeah, there they are. I'm skipping them. Okay. So, this is a cartoon written by somebody who who thought that the pigs were suck, sucking at the at the uh, uh, teats of euro of the euro. Uh, obviously, thought they didn't deserve the benefits they were getting. See, there's the euro pig, and these are the pigs. Well, obviously, the countries who are in this category don't like to be called that. <laughs> All right? So, uh, yeah. Let me go back. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the Greek crisis for a bit. It's not over yet. Um, we still might get a Grexit. We don't know for sure, but, you know, it, it, it looked for a while like things had been at least calm down. So in, 2000, in 2010, um, the first sign of the need for a bailout occurred and the euro, uh, a, a huge euro bailout loan was provided to Greece, uh, $45 billion, in exchange for a bunch of concessions, uh, mainly austerity programs. Uh, the Greek bond ratings was slashed to junk status. So in other words, if you have a junk bond, 
your interest rate is going to go up. Uh, does anybody own junk bonds? You can't. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the reason you invest in junk bonds. So, uh, everybody know about the rating system? I mean, you've seen the, the big short, so you know about the rating system, right? Yeah. So, so, if you have a triple A rating, that's the best. Um, I think triple B rating, is that junk? Or, anybody know? No. No. It has to be even lower. Yeah. 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 C. C. C plus or, I don't know. Yeah. B. 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 Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, um, they, they got... Uh, their bond rating was slashed to chunks. That means people thought they weren't going to be able to pay back their loans, and they were right. In uh, May of 2010, the government announced austerity measures. Uh, in October, uh, they got a second bailout loan of 130 billion euros. Uh, the government fell in November, uh, the Papandreou government, and the interim government adopted even further austerity measures. Um, eventually, that coalition uh, lost power, uh, was succeeded in 2014 by a new government under the, the Syriza party, uh, led by Alexis Tsipras, uh, who appointed Yanis Varoufakis as his finance minister. This is Mr. Tsipras here, that's Angela Merkel, and this is... That's uh, French. Yeah, French. Francois Hollande. So, um, He's getting a stern talking to, <laughs> I think. Anyway, uh, July 2015, a referendum uh, was announced uh, by uh, Prime Minister Tsipras, uh, basically uh, trying to get Greeks to vote against new austerity measures, and the referendum failed. Um, so Varoufakis, the finance minister, quit. Uh, but Mr. Tsipras stayed on and replaced him with a, a more moderate type guy. Basically, Varoufakis was kind of a, he was, he was trying to bargain as hard as possible for less austerity, and he wasn't successful. So, here's the budget deficit. You see that Greeks actually did reduce their budget deficit quite markedly uh, at the cost of much higher unemployment. Their economic growth has been pretty awful. Their unit labor costs have declined drastically, so the costs of austerity are palpable and uh, very difficult uh, for the Greeks. There's uh, Giannis Varoufakis. Uh, he rode a motorcycle. He never wore suits. Very colorful figure. I uh, kind of thought he was he was he was neat. Um, this, this is an anti-austerity protest. Uh, so there's a scissors with a line through it and, uh, and a ski mask, I guess. What is that? What are those called? I think that's a... Uh, uh, what's that? No, that, that, that monster movie. Oh, right, right, right. Hall Halloween or something like that. Oh, Halloween, yeah. Yeah. Slasher movies. Yeah, right. And uh, this is uh, the European Union Ford with a flag on it. And it's a, uh, instead of a wooden horse, it's a wooden middle finger. And I said, I think it's the Greeks, Angela. <laughs> so actually, a lot of really interesting political cartoons around this time uh, for the Greeks. A lot of wooden horses of various kinds. And anyway, there's another political cartoon I kind of like. <laughs> <laughs> These are very chilly birds. Yeah. Angry children. They're all angry. <laughs> now, this is Banksy. Everybody, have we heard of Banksy here? He's a street artist. We don't know who he is. Still haven't figured out who he is. But he, he puts these things up everywhere. He was in New York not too long ago. But he has this little girl with the Greek flag as a skirt. And she's let go of the Euro balloon. So, yeah, quite a nice one. Okay, you saw that one already? Okay, so here's another cartoon, and I'm going to transition to Brexit. Um, so there's Greece, and there's, I guess, the UK. Doesn't really look much like David Cameron, but anyway. And there's Angela Merkel holding on to it, the two of them to try to keep them from leaving Europe. So. <coughs> All right. 
so Brexit. Let's let's go over Brexit a bit. And um, I must say, it's hard to keep up with the news on this. I have been monitoring it day by day. It's, it's sort of one of, one of the political scientists' nightmare. <laughs> sort of like the U.S. elections. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you keep track of something that's moving so quickly? Um, okay, there's the four. That's the Leave group, and the Against. That's the Remain group, okay? And uh, strangely enough, the Tories are split. So here's David Cameron, the Prime Minister, a Conservative Party member, and here's Boris Johnson, the former mayor of London, uh, on the other side. He's a Tory, too. Okay? Um, then on the Labour side, I shouldn't have put them so far on the Remain part because this is uh, Jeremy Corbyn. Corbyn or Corbyn? Corbyn. 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 <laughs> Corbyn is, he's the head of the Labour Party at the moment. He's a bit of a firebrand. And uh, notice it's, behind him it says vote Remain, but he hasn't been entirely clear. And members of the Labour Party, when they're asking polls, should we leave or should we stay? Mostly they say leave, because they think that's the party's position. So the party hasn't made its position clear to the Labor Party voters. Um, and uh, he opposes leaving for some very interesting reasons. He thinks that Labor would suffer under an exit negotiated by a conservative government. So, and particularly that Labor would lose certain legal protections that it enjoys under the European Union system that it doesn't enjoy, would not enjoy under a Conservative Party-led uh, separate Britain. Uh, he understands that a lot of the rank and file would just as soon leave, but, uh, but he's trying to convince them, and somewhat belatedly trying to convince them to, to vote Remain. Uh, then we have the UKIP, the United Kingdom Independence Party, which has recently increased its share of the vote to, I think, roughly 20%, uh, which is amazing. They're a right-wing uh, nationalist party who are uh, deeply opposed to immigration. So just as we have people who think we should build a wall, so does UKIP think that there should be no more immigration into the UK? And they use a lot of the same rhetoric. You know, we want our country back. Make Britain great again. <laughs> they definitely don't wear caps. Okay. So here's a, here's a long-term view of polls about leaving or staying uh, starting in 1977. You can see that in the, in the late 70s, uh, a lot of people in Britain wanted to leave. But then they changed their minds around the, the early, early to mid 80s, and the majority wanted to stay in. And it stayed pretty much that way, although with, with some variance. Um, only recently uh, have we seen, and I'll go to the next slide, have we seen that basically um, remain and leave are roughly neck and neck. The latest poll, I think, showed 45 uh, to leave and 40 to stay. Uh, so we have two different kinds of indicators of what, how the votes can go. And by the way, the pollsters did terribly in predicting the last British election. <laughs> and you know, our pollsters haven't done so good. No. Yeah, right? And you remember how they predicted things for uh, the uh, primaries here. Uh, and, and look at the, the don't knows are still a pretty big, big number. Um, are they, they going to vote the don't knows? You don't. We don't know. <laughs> I mean, you never know, really. No, no, no. A lot of political scientists have done work saying, when do people make up their mind about who they're going to vote for? And there are a fair number of people who wait like until 24 hours before they vote. How many, I mean, do you get calls from your neighbors? I mean, particularly for local elections, we do. We get calls the day before the election. So who should I vote for? And, you know. I mean, it's expensive to pay attention to all that stuff. <laughs> People don't do it. All right. So, uh, besides 
Brexit, Brexit, uh, the Eurozone issue, issues of various kind and slow growth, we have the added question of what's called the migration crisis. It it's, has sort of reached crisis levels. And uh, you see the, the biggest uh, uh, movement of people in 2015. Um, the largest numbers of seeking asylum are Syrians, Afghanis, and Iraqis. So clearly the Syrians and, Af and the, well, they're all escaping from war. It's clear that that's what they're doing. Um, the largest number of asylum applications are in Germany, but increasingly you see huge numbers in Greece and Turkey. The, Turkey has at least two million Syrian refugees. It had one million just a year ago. I believe it's two million now. And uh, I just saw something about the number of displaced people in Syria. It's like 12 million. So there's a whole bunch of people who are, are refugees within Syria who are trying to get out. So the potential for more people leaving is, is pretty big. How many total population of Syria is, what, 22, 24? Yeah, it's not that big. So, you know, you've got a bunch of people around Damascus who are loyal to uh, you know, Assad. They don't need to leave. But almost everybody else in Syria is in some ways in harm's way. So. Who can blame them? Uh, there was a deal done in March 2016 to send the Greek asylum seekers to Turkey. So this is the European Union that negotiated this, and Angela Merkel was a key person. Um, so the Greek asylum seekers would go to Turkey in exchange for a lot of money going to Turkey to help pay for uh, resettling those people. and. Uh, Turkey's been trying to get into the European <coughs> Union for a long time. And anybody know why the, the Europeans have not wanted Turkey in so far? Yes. Yes. So, uh, their uh, human rights record is not very good. Right. It's and getting worse. And it's getting worse. It's not great. No, clearly. And so one of the big objections to the deal was that this rewards Turkey for bad behavior, so don't do this. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, what are you going to do about the migration crisis if you don't get Turkey involved in it? It's, it's a real problem. Um, from Turkey's point of view, this is a, not an opportunity. You, you can't blame um, them for trying in this case. What's the name of the prime minister? Erdogan. Erdogan. You can't blame Erdogan for trying to use this moment to bargain for whatever deal he can get. And they have taken a huge... I mean, you can see Syria if you go to. Has anybody been to Turkey recently? Did you Did you see Syrians at all? No. I mean, you could see them when I was there a couple of years ago. They were everywhere. They were you know, camped out on the streets and stuff. But, and it's a great time to buy Syrian artifacts. I hate to say that. It sounds like Donald Trump. I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, but there's an image that you're all familiar with of people trying to get across uh, the Mediterranean in these overpacked boats. Uh, the Italian uh, Coast Guard has been involved in rescuing people who are trying to get to, to Italy, I guess. But here, here's the route. So you've got Iraq, Syria. They usually can go by land to Turkey. From Turkey, they hit those two islands off the coast of Turkey and then take ferries across to Greece. Uh, they try to go by land, but uh, those, land, those land passages are difficult now. There's what's called a border fence. Talk about building a fence. And uh, uh, let's see, these countries, these orange countries, are refusing access to migrants without visas. So basically, that route has been sort of cut off. So for Europe, the problem is how to distribute the costs from dealing with this incredible uh, movement of people. Uh, it, it's It, it's a major problem for the Europeans. You know, if you think about our 11 million undocumented people, uh, it doesn't seem so big. Um, but for Europeans, it's it's a very sensitive issue. Okay, so uh, I told you that about the rise of the right wing parties, uh, what are called Eurosceptic right wing parties. And there's been an increase in their vote. There's the UKIP there, from 16% to 24% in polls. 
Uh, the Austrian Freedom Party has gone up, the National Front of France, that's Le Pen, and Marie Le Pen, the Marine Le Pen, the, the daughter of uh, even worse Le Pen. Mm. Uh, Danish, <laughs> Danish People's Party, Dutch Freedom Party, etc. So, um, yeah. Where's Poland? Uh, oh. They have a big problem. You know, courts didn't do that. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe they don't. Well, I'm sure they do. It's a good question. I don't know what Paul means. Okay, so I'm going to conclude. And uh, so basically, the Europeans are still recovering from the crisis. They're just like we are, actually, but uh, they're a little bit behind us. Uh, there's growing inequality between rich and poor countries in Europe and between young and old workers. Most of the unemployment I told you about before is mostly young people. Um, and uh, the threat of EU debt defaults and exits is affecting the global economy. Uh, we should all be worried. I mean, I'm retired. I have a pension. Uh, a lot of my pension is invested in uh, various securities in, in the market. And uh, there will be consequences if the British decide to leave. Mostly negative. Because basically what the International Monetary Fund has said is that the world growth rate will take a hit if the British leave the European Union. So the British obviously will feel it more than us, but we'll feel it. Uh, Syrian migration issue is further dividing the countries of the region and uh, helping to rise uh, the rise of regular forces. So the question for us is, what's our interest? You know, it, it, I, I'm assuming, of course, that. Uh, there are probably non-American citizens here in the audience. If so, I apologize for the obvious U.S. bias of that last question. But um, anybody have any ideas about how we should think about our interests? I think one of them would be uh, Europe. Yeah. 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 trade. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, from the trade angle, uh, we want Europe to be strong. We don't want them to be too strong. But we want them to buy our stuff, and they, we want them to sell us stuff that we really need. Right? Uh, well, we get a lot of great machinery from Germany, for example, or Italy, for that matter. And um, uh, we buy a lot of luxury items from Europe, which we would miss if the Europeans suffer more. Yes. So, so is there any planning, or is there anybody looking at how to execute? A, a Brexit, if it happens, or are they going to wait to the vote and then start thinking? Um, they obviously aren't going to start planning until the vote occurred, right? Because you don't want to... But clearly, there are people in Whitehall, the, you know, the bureaucracy, who are already got their <coughs> Excel charts out, trying to figure out what's going to happen and how do we deal with it. Um, and you can... I mean, MI5, probably. <laughs> and we'll, and then so try to figure out who to yeah. shoot. <laughs> the corollary of that is once it's voted in, how long is there? Is it expected to have some time? You're asking all the questions that everybody no. in Europe and Britain wants to know. They want to know. And, and clearly the government has some leeway. Um, if, if the population votes majority to leave, you'll see the Cameron government will have to call a new election. Because yeah, that's basically a referendum against the Tories, and uh, even though some Tories support leaving, um, and then they do, you know, it. Wh what do we do if we have a referendum? We kind of, you know, the, when the when the population says you must do that, you kind of have you you can only disobey that at some cost, and but you know there could be some efforts to say this is just. Prudent, imprudent. We need to have another one of these. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, yeah. What What other countries do you think might follow Britain now that Britain does oh, exit? Oh God, I hate to I hate to even speculate. I, I don't I don't know. I mean, obviously Greece is still a candidate. Yeah. yeah. Yes. What do you think would be the consequences of keeping the European Union but dissolving the euro? Dissolving the euro. <sighs> Well, the uh, so the euro is considered to be the like, like the crown, the, the jewel in the crown, I guess, especially by the Germans. And 
Um, yeah, there's been a lot of talk about with Europe of two speeds or Europe of three speeds that you could have a core European group that remains in the Eurozone, remains in the European Union, uh, and doesn't care much about the rest or, or lets the other people do whatever they want. That, that's, that's one scenario that people have thought about. Um, but I think if people start, if countries start leaving the Euro, Eurozone or the European Union, uh, things look bad for the future of the European Union. So, so European elites will do whatever they can to sort of prevent that. Uh, it may be too late. I don't know. Yes. I think one of the issues that they have to deal with is the fact that the wealthy countries like Germany, Belgium, France, they have benefited greatly from the Eurozone. Yeah. Because, but they've put a lot of money into it. They've invested tremendously in these poorer countries in order to increase their own markets for their goods. Uh, well, right. And, and um, a fair amount of uh, Greek debt is owned by German banks, for example. Uh, one cartoon showed um, uh, Germany basically um, buying all... I know golf courses, I forget which, or resorts in Greece, you know, is turning it into a, like a vacation villa place, um, which they might do. I don't know. Uh, I, I did not talk about the whole issue. So how has the financial system continued in light of all these risky situations? And so at first, uh, it was private banks that were lending money to Greece, for example. And then the private bank said, uh, we don't think these loans will be repaid. Uh, we'd like to get rid of them, get them off our balance books. Um, the European Central Bank stepped in and purchased a lot of those loans at a discount. And now the European bank has a lot of bad loans on its books. So the question is, how sustainable is that? So you know, I, I wanted to talk about opportunities. Right now, things aren't looking good. Um, other questions or comments? Yes. You know, in the last 30 years uh, in the U.S., there have been quite a few new companies formed. Yeah. Say Apple, Netflix, uh, Google, <coughs> Facebook. What are the big new European companies? And I can't think of them. Mm. Why are they not being formed here? They have universities there. They have an educated populace. Uh, why is that? I, I don't get it. Uh, there are a few exceptions. So uh, uh, you've got big European companies uh, like, well, used to be people would point to Nokia, Finland, as a, as a cell phone manufacturer, but they've basically gotten out of the cell phone handset business to concentrate on more profitable businesses. Uh, I think SAP, you know what SAP is? It's yeah. a big database company. Oracle is a big database company. But are they new? Did they form SAP? No, I was, just, I was starting with big companies. There are a lot of little companies, a lot of startups. Um, there's, what's the, yes? Aren't they big in uh, uh, medical devices? Yeah, yeah, they're doing Siemens. Siemens is a big, another big company that's been, it's not doing great. I and mean, you saw what happened to VW. But they're all, <laughs> they're all company, like BMW or Mercedes or, I'm talking about something brand new, something like Facebook, something like the Apple. Well, one of the things that the Europeans are behind in, besides all the other things I already talked about, is in venture capital and startup culture. And uh, they're trying to set that up. Uh, now they realize that they're behind, particularly in technology. Uh, they do okay in chemicals, pharmaceuticals, uh, some big heavy industrial equipment. Uh, they actually have a very active software coding um, subclusters in various places. But the capital system in Europe is a little bit more hidebound than the capital. So I, before 2007, I used to think, boy, they, they really they should adopt our system. <laughs> but then, <laughs> well, yeah. they did. The problem is they did adopt their system. They bought a lot of, of CDOs and, and mortgage-backed securities. <laughs> so, uh, 
Yeah. 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 But uh, but they don't have a very good startup culture, and, and it's a very much bank-centered environment. So uh, Europeans need to create a much more flexible and uh, startup oriented financial system which they don't currently have. A lot more regulated. <clears throat> well, that's the Wall Street Journal story. Well, you know? I lived over there. And yeah. You can't, in the Netherlands, you can't in even America. start any kind of business without a Dutch person being a part owner. Uh, they're a, 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 with a business degree. Plus, once you get started and you hire people, mm -hmm. you cannot fire any. Yes. So, so a lot of that has changed with the austerity measures. Ability to fire has gotten a little easier, but you're right; it's still there. Uh, labor labor market inflexibility is what they call that. It costs so much to fire someone. It's incredible. That is true. So there are still quite a lot of reforms that can be done. I, I mean, you don't want them to go completely whole hog and adopt the you know, U.S. system. <laughs> No. Because it doesn't work out so well for us. Well, didn't they recover better? <laughs> we did, and, and you know, in terms of evidence for the importance of regulation, the British are the least regulated of all the major European countries, and their economy has done slightly better. Okay, and particularly in the startup area. So, uh, so there is an argument for less regulation is better, um, but you have to get those changes passed by European publics who don't believe that, who think that regulation is good. And uh, you might all take a look at uh, Michael Moore's latest uh, movie. Have you seen that one? Where to Invade Next? Uh, yeah, anyway. Michael Moore. It's, it's, yeah, who do we, so he goes, he goes to Finland, looks at their school system, he goes to Italy to look at their uh, worker uh, management relations. He, he goes to a lot of places and, and arguing that they do it better than we do. Uh, he's a lefty, so of course you've got it discounted by like 80%, but nevertheless, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting because he deals with a lot of those issues that, that uh, why did the Europeans do it differently from us? And I don't think they're going to change radically on these things. I think they, they like their system. Most people benefit quite well, particularly the elderly uh, and the wealthy do very well in Europe. So, so the problem is how to convince them uh, to change the system. Yes? Um, just a brief question. I feel like most everyone here is more knowledgeable than I am about the issues here. but. Um, I have been hearing things about when we're talking about the environment and saving the environment and so forth, that the Europeans are really pretty far ahead of us in uh, producing other forms of energy and that sort of thing. I don't, can you speak to that at all as to how that plays a role in any of this? Yes, I mean, the Europeans have taken uh, the idea of green economy further than us. And uh, so if you go to Denmark, for example, and you go to Copenhagen, you can see these big windmills offshore. Um, the, uh, I forget which country. I think it is the Danes who also have tried experiments with um, um, using meters in the houses to get people to economize on electricity uses. And, uh, there are a lot of experiments going on in different parts of the world, more solar, more wind power, and so forth. And, they are ahead of us on some of this. Um, Turkey has done wonders with solar energy. Who? Turkey. Turkey. Oh, Turkey. Well, that's a, yeah. I remember when I was in Turkey a couple years ago. They they had uh, street lights. No, I'm, I'm thinking of China. China has street lights with solar panels. So instead of having um, you know the, the street lights connected to the electrical grid. They're all solar powered, I guess. But the pollution is so thick in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so the pollution keeps the uh, solar cells from charging, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but one, one of the reasons why people are, are installing solar panels here in the United States is because the Chinese have been dumping solar panels on our market. So they, they basically killed our solar panel industry by engaging in subsidies and so forth, and particularly of exports. So. 80% of France's electricity is generated by nuclear. Yes. And they have a good, safe way of getting rid of their... Uh, well, that's what they said. I'm not sure I 
believe it. It's called clay. Wow. How do you safely dispose of something that has a half-life of 500 million years? I, mean, you know, I don't know. Yes. You said you wanted to talk about opportunities. Ah, opportunities. Well, uh, for us, there are so. I mean, I, I think uh, uh, it may be cheaper, like I said, to go there. And there may be some real opportunities. Basically, what in the last few years, we've seen Europeans come to the U.S. to buy companies here. And there may be some interesting opportunities the other direction. Uh, although I think the main country that's purchasing European countries right, companies right now is China. So, uh, yes? What's the future hope for Greece? You know, it's all, it's, for decades people have been saying that Italy is going down the tubes, but it always appeared to me that the Italians live pretty well. It's the poor Greeks and the poor Italians who do terribly at the moment. And um, so th there are very, uh, all people everywhere are enterprising and energetic. <laughs> Let's put it that way. If they could get some, some good, consistent leadership. So, for example, right now I'm hopeful about Peru because they just elected this guy named Pedro Pablo Kuczynski, who's one of the few world leaders that I actually know. And I can tell you, he was a banker. He's an okay guy, um, you know. And th they're better off than under uh, Fujimori Jr. So, you know, often leadership can make a big difference. So if they change leadership, right now the Greeks are, you know, at least they've got people who are sympathetic to the plight of the poor. But uh, they've got to get competent people who are sympathetic. So, for example, take Brazil. Um, uh, another uh, person that I was familiar with uh, was uh, uh, um, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, who was basically a political scientist, sociologist, uh, and uh, he became a very good president, first finance minister and then president. So leadership is really very important. But another thing is, you know, uh, you raise the issue of regulation. A lot of things can happen when they sort of get out of the way of the people, not necessarily the businesses, but the people, <coughs> and let them go to town. And I think, again, the environments are a little bit unfavorable to that. So that, that could be a, an area for change. Yes? I, I, I was led to understand that part of the Greek problem is they don't collect income taxes. They have income taxes, but they're such a developed underground economy that avoids them in so many different ways that that's a major part of their uh, financial crisis, that they can't collect an income tax. Yes, they, they do very poorly at collecting taxes. And I, I believe they have a VAT tax. The VAT tax is like 25% now. You know, they, they say, you know, physicians will... You know, they have their fees, and they collect it under the table that they, and it never occurred, and there's, there's really a, a strongly developed under, sort of an underground economy there uh, that's uh, a, a significant part of their problem. Well, and we, we have one of those, too, but uh, <laughs> ours isn't as big. I mean, it's we've not got... as developed. No, ours isn't. You know, why don't we have as bad a, bad a situation as they do? Well, we have... I guess on the flip side of that is the IRS that will seize your assets at, at, at their whim if they think you're cheating. You know, and you can appeal to the courts, but you know they have a lot of power, and you have to give your tax collectors that kind of authority. And so far in Greece, they have not wanted to give their tax collectors that kind of authority, and it's mostly the upper income people who who want to keep away from this. So you have to create a political coalition that we thought Syriza was going to do that. Of course, one of the consequences of clamping down on the rich is that they leave the country or they take their money out. And we saw a major capital flight in Greece. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, what do the Europeans think of our election process? <laughs> and how do they think it will affect them? Man, I read The Economist all the time. And they're making all kinds of snide comments about <laughs> our election. <laughs> Yeah, they can't believe. I can't believe. It. <laughs> we can't either. Yeah, really? Who can? I, I mean, I don't want to ask the Trump supporters to raise their hands. But. 
I yeah, hope you don't get any hands. <laughs> well, I'm not even going to. Uh, yeah. um, we right. should put Trump together with the guy from the super right wing guy from Great Britain and give them a piece of land so they can make their country great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why don't we just give them the Trump Empire? They could do it. <laughs> but Trump, Trump won't share it. It's good. Uh, you know, what can we say? I mean, they loved it when we elected President Obama. They thought he was great. And they still think he's still great. Yeah. I think that's still crazy. And they thought more of us as a country when we elected President Obama, which is also sort of a side benefit. They don't understand. Um, when I lived in England, it was at the time when Goldwater was nominated. Yeah. Well, forget about the, the fact that Goldwater was Goldwater, et cetera, et cetera. But they didn't understand how that happened because they didn't understand our political system. Oh, yeah. And I think that's part of it as well. They don't, they don't have primaries like we do. They don't have election periods right. like we do. Right. They, they don't have a federal system other than... Uh, couple of countries. Uh -huh. So a lot of it is just they don't understand our politics. So. We don't understand our system very well. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, it's so complicated. Well, I was here on my life rehearsal. Mark rehearsed on Thursday. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's a very complicated. You know, we, we have this federal system. That, uh, well, anyway, what can I say? I, and I've seen some very comical analyses of American politics from Europeans. I mean, they actually think that there's, there's a, you know, that the parliament, that uh, the Congress is seated the way the UK Parliament, the, oh, yeah. with the left on the left and the oh, right on the right. Oh, <laughs> they just don't have a clip. They just don't have the frame of reference. Uh, a lot of them don't. Right? They've gotten very sophisticated. They, you see some very good U.S. analyses, for example, in France or in Germany. That they, they put the effort in. The Russians do too, actually. They understand our political system pretty well. But uh, I must say it's a challenge. That's one of our challenges. Yeah. Would you talk more about immigration? Immigration. Okay. Uh, the, it seems to me that the, the core problem is the instability in the Middle East and in that region. And uh, until you can address that, until you can re reduce the insecurity of the general population there, this problem is going to remain and perhaps have to get worse. Um, that Turkish deal that I talked about, I think ev eventually Turkey's going to have, there will be some settlement of the differences between Turkey and the European Union. Uh, to, mostly to the, well, I don't know, to the advantage of Turkey that they're having trouble dealing with the two million that they have now. So. But uh, and then in terms of other aspects, I mean, um, the Europeans have basically given quite a lot of, well, the, the, the European populations who are not immigrants or not recent immigrants uh, feel very badly about the fact that their tax dollars are going to support immigrants that they think are not deserving. So we, the same attitude we have in the U.S., you can see that same attitude in Europe. And it's really, the longer this crisis goes on, the worse that gets. So, so there's a real incentive for European elites uh, to do something about it. I, the question is, is there the will for them to, say, for example, get more actively involved in trying to intervene or set, settle some of the, the long-standing disputes uh, that led to the war and, and to the movement of people? And I don't see it. I frankly don't see it. Yes. Any other? I think we're out of time pretty much, but I'll take one. I'll take one. Uh, any questions, please? Thank you. Oh,
Actually, seem to be more active in NATO than they are in the European Union. But uh, uh, they've turned, I think they've turned somewhat conservative in terms of their politics. I remember that. Um, and there's been quite a, a lot of reform of the of the social welfare system in Sweden to try to in what respect? Uh, cutting back some of the less effective programs and some of the more expensive programs. I think they've cut back on uh, uh, various you know, various uh, aspects of they're basically trying to cut costs. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, but their, their tax rates are already quite high. Mm -hmm. uh, and their economy is? Uh, what I've seen, they're, they're, they're doing about as well as the rest of Northern Europe. So, and sort of stable. Yeah, stable, unemployment, relatively low compared to the rest of right. Europe. Because they're, they're more, it seems like they're a more homogenous group as well. Or am I wrong well, on that? Oh, no, there are a lot of immigrants. A lot of immigrants? immigrants. Especially Eastern European immigrants. Eastern European, and Sweden. African. Uh -huh. and Sweden. Uh -huh. uh, I think they're beginning to get Afghans. Um, they, they have a great system for basically incorporating people into through the school system and, uh, and the churches are quite active Wonderful. as well. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's really so it's more, more of all these countries, maybe yeah. a little bit more stable, you think? Yeah, in Norway I think it's the same thing. Uh -huh. they, 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 well, they have that kind of general feeling that you know we're all in it together and you can become Swedish if you put the effort in. Yeah, but is Norway, Norway is Norway part of the European Union? Uh, yeah, it's not a, a part of the Eurozone, I think. But yeah. Yeah, no, all the Scandinavians are now in, uh -huh. including the Finns. I was going right. to say, but the Finns, I think, too. Yeah, but the none, are, none in terms of the Euro. They don't, none of them no, have I don't the Euro. Think, I don't yeah. Know, they're so still, still it's the Kroner, and, uh, yeah. No, they're, they're yeah, we, we took the, the, the tunnel bridge thing from... Denmark to Sweden. That, that was oh. interesting. But apparently the uh, the Danish economy is so expensive that the Danes will go to Sweden to shop. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that tells you that the Swedes at least compared to Denmark. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do the French take the channel to Britain to shop? Or oh, sure. Sure. You see them all the time. You go into London and on the tube, there'll be all these French kids. And they love the British souvenirs, you know, the Various, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the Queen waving. But they love like a bobblehead. Yeah, but like a bobblehead. Only it's like a solar, oh, solar. Yeah, I got it. Well, the, thank you very much. This was very interesting. A huge topic. <laughs> it is. I, I wanted to ask you a question. On, uh, you were, you're not an economist. But you have some economic theories. Uh, well, you know, I've some heard background. one person say that. Uh, the reason our economy has done better than Europe, Europe was quantitative easing, and that uh, well, and the euro of their central bank, had they done quantitative easing, they may have may not have suffered as much as they have. Well, they did do quantitative easing actually. Yeah, they did it later than us. Yeah, they did it later. And uh, the and question is, how sustainable is it? Oh yeah, yeah, it definitely helped. The European Central Bank. Okay did some quantitative easing and still buying bonds.